So this is the Radiant City lecture. Um, Corbusier called it the Ville Radius. And uh, so much of what happened in the 20th century comes back to Corbusier. Not just in architecture, but some would say even more so in terms of the larger built environment uh, of the developed and the developing world. And it's not so much his fault, the things, people love to blame Corbusier uh, for everything that went wrong, but he basically came, he, he didn't even invent all these things, he pulled them together in a way that no one else did, and he showed them to us, and then they took on a life of their own. He quickly moved on to other things, and uh, it was like a teenage child who uh, grew up, left home, and uh, took on a life of its own. Uh, and Corbusier uh, says, not my problem. It's not my fault. Um, so referring back to the, the problem of housing, the industrial city said workers need to live where, near where they work. Uh, and so extremely high density conditions uh, created health problems because of the don't shit where you, shit where you live uh, rules. And so the laws were changed to introduce light and air into every room. And so you get things like these air shafts uh, in the tenement housing uh, in places like New York City. And then the laws change over the years and uh, goes can't get an arrow here, can I? Oh, there's an arrow. Okay. So the laws change and the amount of light and air available to every unit increases and market forces change and force housing developers to create ever more uh, open conditions. Uh, and so this is uh, a study of the evolution of housing to maintain high densities uh, but to make uh, the living conditions higher quality and healthier. And so there was a whole period of architectural analysis that, had, uh, that dealt with the geometry of these issues. And uh, so you compare these two different arrangements and you look at the possibilities for balancing density with open space and try to create a similar economic return uh, even if you are housing a few fewer people. And uh, then the urban reform movements uh, of the early 20th century, they tried to eliminate a lot of the uh, insalubrious, which is the term they used, insalubrious housing, which means unhealthy, and replace it with healthier housing. And part of that was the Garden City movement. Uh, and this is an example from Hampstead uh, and um, here's the work of a young architect working uh, in the mode of the Garden City. Uh, the man, uh, young Pierre Jeanneré, who later became Le Corbusier. And this is the kind of housing. He started out as a watch uh, engraver. And so he was trained in the decorative arts. Uh, and this is the kind of Garden City style housing that he was working on in his early internship period of his career. Now, at around the same time, uh, Tony Garnier, who'd won the, the uh, Academy of Rome Prize to go study in Rome, was experimenting with the implications of the industrial city. What is the new city going to uh, need uh, in the 20th century? So in 1901, he started developing these ideas into the design of an industrial city. The main thing that you should see here is he's dealing with an actual landscape, and he is saying that the industrial infrastructure needs to be located in one place, and the rest of the city needs to be separated from it. And so this separation of industry and the city was the crucial thing. 
He was also dealing with the recently rediscovered material uh, steel reinforced concrete. They forgot the recipe. They had it in Rome, but then they forgot the recipe. And it wasn't until the mid 19th century that we had it back. Uh, these, these are the housing types that he imagined were the natural forms of this industrial material of steel reinforced concrete. Um, other experiments in the cities of Europe, uh, this is in the Netherlands, uh, imagined a thin crust of housing uh, for the perimeter of the block and then other functions on the interior of the block. And in these cases, these functions are for children. So these are schools in the protected interior uh, with the protective wall of housing on the outside. So it's a similar approach. It has the benefit of reinforcing these public spaces of the street wall on the outside and having two completely different worlds, the world of the street and the world protected zone of the interior block. And this should look familiar because it's a similar, similar to the outcome of the Garden City. Now this is called the Zeilenbau. Uh, the Zeilenbau approach uh, that developed in Germany, where it's all about solar orientation. So two things happen. The solar orientation becomes the, the most important thing. And uh, the, uh, the other thing that happens is the dissolution of the street wall. And so you see that most clearly in the contrast between uh, Oud's approach in the Netherlands with the perimeter housing and the Zeilenbau approach in Germany, where there is no longer a clear definition of street. Street as a spatially defined volume of public realm you have instead, you have paved areas for traffic, but that's different than a street. A street is a human space. A street uh, accommodates vehicles, but it is primarily for people. And there's a face on either side that defines the space, and it is a volume, it's a clearly defined volume of space, like a, like a room. Uh, and then in the Zeilenbau approach, that room goes away. And it's the only thing you have instead are the, the leftover spaces uh, once you put in the buildings. Now, this should look familiar, this approach. Does it look familiar? Have you seen it? If you look out the window, yes. If you look out the window, Wentworth is surrounded by Zeilenbau housing where the streets are the spaces that are left over once you build the buildings. And this became uh, the dominant approach. It became the key characteristic of modern space in the city, is you get rid of the streets and you uh, orient housing according to solar principles. Um, and so this is an early housing exhibition uh, of mo the modern city. Uh, and you see these types of proposals of varying densities. Some are slabs and some are uh, freestanding buildings. And this is uh, a characteristic of this time as a man by the name of Hilbesheimer. This is a very famous image of what the world uh, of modern cities was to be. And then one of the crucial ideas which sounds sensible, is the separation of automobile traffic, of motorized traffic, and non-motorized traffic, of pedestrians. And you let the ground plane be populated by these motor vehicles zipping around, and you give the, the fragile humans a protected space lifted up off the ground. Sounds great, uh, but we'll see what happens. In the meantime, young uh, Corbusier was traveling through Italy, and he became uh, very fascinated by this uh, monastery in, the, in Ima, Italy. And this monastery uh, 
had the typical cloister arrangement around a courtyard, and then the monks' cells arranged around that. And you'll notice that these monks' cells have these garden spaces and a two-story uh, living unit. This becomes uh, very influential <laughs> on Corbusier's ideas of the proper mode of living. So it comes out of this monk cell. There's a garden that is contained by an architectural wall. So in a way, he is saying that modern residential space incorporates exterior space and interior space. Uh, it occurs on two levels, and this is his analysis of this monk cell uh, in the monastery. And so this is technically exterior, but it's included in the architectural volume of the monk cell. And it's only beyond the wall that <coughs> the landscape uh, takes over. And here's the view from a second story terrace out into the garden. There's the wall. There's the landscape beyond. And so instead of having just inside, outside, there is inside, completely enclosed, inside that's open to the outside, here, and then there's outside that's contained within the architecture, and then there's the outside beyond the architectural container. And if you've studied uh, Villa Savoie, you will recognize that that is exactly the hierarchy of space that he employs in the Villa Savoie. Well, he didn't just use it in the Villa Savoie. He developed uh, a series of prototypical housing units, the Citrion house, and this unit, uh, which uses a similar approach. And he originally was envisioning this not as, as it was arranged in the monastery, where you have units arranged around a cloister. Um, it's interesting to notice that in the monastery, it's similar to the Garden City in that there is the, the circulation world of, of humanity. And then there's the natural world on the other side. And so in a way, this creates that housing sitting in that zone in between the connection to culture and to nature. And so he's picturing uh, he's really responding to the same set of forces as Ebenezer Howard and Clarence Stein at Radburn. Uh, but now he's picturing it not as it's organized in Radburn, not as it organized in the monastery, but in stacked modular units. Uh, and you should recognize in this image the same arrangement of contained outdoor space as part of the unit itself. And when he first proposes it, he organizes it in a position in the landscape that, in a way, confesses immediately the, uh, how much it owes to the monastery out of which the idea emerges. It's practically the same view. So he deploys them as singular elements uh, for the Esprit Nouveau uh, exposition. But he also starts to draw entire cities made up of these units, stacked not as so much as in the monastery, but in a slightly different arrangement of much higher densities. But maintaining the open space, learning the lessons of these earlier studies of geometry and economy and sunlight that we saw the first slides, and arranging them in entire cities. He also takes this idea from Eugene Ennard, who was the, um, the uh, man who took over from Haussmann in Paris, and the idea of redon, which uh, don in French is T. <coughs> so these are imagined as a series of T. When we look down the view, the perspective view of this boulevard, we see what appears to be a building, a garden, a building, a garden, a building, a garden, all the way down. But it's actually a building that turns the corner. That by creating buildings, linear buildings, that wrap around and turn corners. I'm sorry, some of these are small. But by turning corners, we create the view down the street of building, garden, building, garden. But it's actually one huge complex. And he develops this into a plan for the radiant city. 
and he places the industrial part down by the bowels. Then he places the uh, residential parts uh, as the main body of the city and in the spine of cultural significance and then the administrative head at the top and then recreational uh, elements surrounding the city. And he does a few different variations on this view. And what he creates is this vision of the tower in the park. By creating open space between all these towers, you create uh, a connection to nature by creating high density housing. And so this, the implications of the housing density uh, are carried forth in the design of the entire city. Now the key thing here is there are four functions of the city, according to Corbusier. The four functions are living, here in the residential quarter, working, either in the factories or in the administrative core. Recreation is number three. And number four is circulation. It's all connected by high-speed motorways. The car was a new thing. The car started uh, mass production in 1907. And the idea was the car and the airplane would become like walking had been to the former city. And he proposed uh, this for Paris. Uh, you bulldoze uh, the historic section of Paris and replace the equivalent in housing. Um, here's Notre Dame. And here's the historic core of Paris. Here's Notre Dame. And the historic core of Paris, the fabric of Paris replaced by this new arrangement uh, of housing and the other functions. And the proposal was to do this in every city in the world. So here are the comparisons between the new fabric in Paris, the new fabric in New York, the new fabric in Buenos Aires. And it actually comes to pass to a certain extent in New York in Stuyvesant Town. Uh, and in other places <coughs> that we'll be looking at in future weeks. I don't want to run over, so let's cap it there. Thank you. I may add a little bit to this online. Yeah. Well, <coughs> so the more more like Say that again. This one, like, 